Well, good evening. Glad to see you. And for those of you out there in internet land, uh, we're having some technical difficulties. And so if your live stream breaks up, uh, just turn it off for a minute or so and then try to get back on. Uh, the problem is with Comcast and surely not with the technical staff that we have here who's highly competent. So <clears throat> we hope that uh, we'll get through this without you having too much problem. <clears throat> we need to pray for Pastor Dean who is in the lovely land of Ukraine and I'm here in the lovely land of Houston. So <laughs> we've swat, swapped places, uh, but pray for Robbie. It's a long flight to Ukraine and eight time zones away from here, and it takes a little bit to get over the jet lag and to get uh, <clears throat> situated in, in that far country. Uh, <clears throat> but we appreciate so much uh, Robbie's uh, going to Ukraine to teach at Word of God College. And uh, it's been a tremendous blessing for us at the Bible College there. And so we're very glad that uh, uh, he's willing to go and uh, you allow him to, to make that trip. So as we come to the Word of God tonight, uh, we need to prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word. So let's take a moment for you to Examine yourself before the Lord, making sure that uh, you're in fellowship so that the Holy Spirit can give us understanding. So shall we pray? I give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you're a God of mercy you're long-suffering, you're patient, and you allow us opportunity, you give us time to grow up, to become acquainted with your plan, your ways. I thank you that you've given us the revelation of everything that we need to know about you and your plan. You've given us the means to understand that. I thank you for your indwelling spirit who teaches us and so we pray that this night your Holy Spirit would give us illumination so that we can better comprehend your plan, your provision, your purpose, your promises to us. And I pray for Robbie that uh, you're going to give him swift recovery from his travels. He might be able to settle into the routine there in uh, Kiev and that uh, he'd be strong and alert and uh, prepared to teach at the Bible College there. So we give thanks for your grace, your provision for us this evening, and pray you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, uh, tonight I'm going to begin talking about a passage that is notoriously difficult to interpret there are many, many different interpretations of this passage, um, and even competent, conservative Bible scholars don't agree. And uh, so I'm going to add one more interpretation to um, the many that are out there, and I hope that perhaps it will shed some light on uh, this particular passage. So if you will turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. There are eight parables found in this particular chapter. The first one being the very well-known parable of the sower, some people call it the parable of the soils, but Jesus called it the parable of the sower, and I think that gives us a clue as to uh, where we ought to put the emphasis and how we ought to interpret 
this particular passage. Now, this is a parable that's found in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's found in Mark 4 and Luke chapter 8. And really, they all need to be studied uh, together to get a full understanding of what is uh, going on in this passage. And there are so many different interpretations of this story. Some have made it a tool for defending either Calvinism or Arminianism, but I don't believe Jesus had that in mind at all. Others have interpreted it as an explanation as to why some respond to the gospel and others do not, or why some evangelism succeeds while most efforts fail, or some have used it to try to explain why some believers fail to live godly lives. But what is almost universal in these interpretations is a failure to look at the context. And of course, the most important thing in interpreting any passage of Scripture is to understand the context in which a statement is given. Now, the Gospel of Matthew informs us that this passage takes place on the same day as the events of Matthew 12, where we read about the unforgivable sin. And so uh, the parables of Matthew 13 were spoken by Christ. Okay. And you'll notice it was on the same day, Matthew 13, 1. On the same day as what? Well, as chapter 12. What happened in chapter 12? It was a Sabbath day, and uh, yet it was one of the busiest days in the life of Jesus. He healed two different people in chapter 12. Then he had this discussion with the Pharisees, and he announced to them that they have committed the unpardonable sin. Now, the unpardonable sin is not an individual sin committed by believers or unbelievers. It's not a sin that can be committed today. It is a sin that was committed by Israel in that they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And so Jesus announced this is a sin that is not going to be forgiven and uh, on the same day now, Jesus is going to give a series of eight parables found in chapter 13. Now, the relationship between chapter 12 and chapter 13 is that of cause to effect. Matthew 12 makes known the cause that led up to Jesus' teaching as he did in Matthew 13. Why did he teach Matthew 13? Well, it's because... They had rejected their king in chapter 12, and judgment has been pronounced upon them. God is going to temporarily turn away from the Jews and turn to the Gentiles. Now, some have interpreted Matthew 13 as a fulfillment of the Old Testament kingdom promises, but we're going to see that six times in chapter 13, he talks about the mysteries, the, old, uh, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, or mysteries. Uh, mystery is found only three times in the gospel, and in each case it is in the same context. We think of mystery, it's uh, something that the Apostle Paul spoke of frequently. We talk about the mystery doctrines of the church age. But the mystery that we find in Matthew chapter 13 deals with the kingdom and not with the church. So we should not make the mistake of saying, oh, we have mystery in the writings of Paul, and now we have uh, the same word found in Matthew, and therefore we're talking about the same thing. Indeed, we are not. Now, the mystery the definition is going to be the same. It means truth which was not revealed until this point. So a mystery is not something that is unknown, but it means here is information that God had not 
previously revealed. And so this is something that's going to uh, now be revealed in connection with the kingdom, and it had not been revealed in the Old Testament. So this is not talking about some church age truth. Jesus is not here talking about the church. The church is not found in this chapter as such. In fact, the word church is not going to occur at all uh, for another three chapters. And he's not going to develop the concept of the church at all uh, in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew is about the kingdom. And so when we read about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven... This is not the church, but it's rather talking about un information that had not been revealed in the Old Testament about the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is much taught in the Old Testament. It is the subject of much prophecy in uh, the book of Psalms and in the prophets. There is much revealed about the kingdom that would be established on the earth, a literal, political physical kingdom on the earth over which Jesus would personally rule sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem. It's a literal kingdom. This is revealed in the Old Testament, but there are some new things that Jesus is going to reveal about the kingdom that we don't find in the Old Testament. So Jesus is now going to reveal things kept secret from the prophets in the Old Testament. So he is now going to also change his method of teaching. From this point on, Jesus is no longer going to be offering the kingdom to Israel. After they have committed that unpardonable sin in Matthew chapter 12, no longer is he going to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No longer will he send out his disciples and tell them to preach the kingdom. No longer will there be this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's done, because Israel now has rejected their king, and the kingdom is postponed. So he is now going to begin communicating and he's going to use also a different method of communication. From this point on, when he is speaking to the multitudes, he is going to be speaking in parables. Now, he will still teach his disciples many things without parables, but not to the multitudes. When he's speaking to the crowd, when he's out in public, he is going to be teaching them through parables. So... Uh, We'll look at uh, a couple of other things here to try to set this up before we get into the passage. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1, talking about this same event, this is the same time, the same day as Matthew 13. It came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Notice what he is teaching, the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. So Jesus, throughout his ministry, taught about the kingdom. And even after his death, burial, and resurrection, he continued to teach about the kingdom. So that we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, uh, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So even after his resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days teaching his disciples about the kingdom. They needed to understand What's going on with the kingdom? It was prophesied in the Old Testament, but it's not going to be established now, and the disciples needed to understand these things about the kingdom, lest they uh, be uh, confused when they are going to start 
getting new information about the church. So the kingdom of God is revealed, but it hasn't been installed yet. It has been postponed, but it has not been eliminated. It's something that is yet future. In Luke chapter 8, we see the parable. A sower went out to sow his seed as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside. It was trampled down. The birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he is saying, you need to pay attention to this, because hearing this message and then responding to it is the crux of the issue about this particular parable. Well, the disciples, they said, what does this parable mean? And he said, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. All right, the kingdom of God that he talks about here, this is the same as the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Matthew usually uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. It's a rather Jewish thing. Rather than using the name of God, they, they have a, a euphemism. And so they indicate the same thing, but typically Matthew will call it the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that Matthew uses this term also because he is building his gospel on the Old Testament and specifically Daniel's reference to the God of heaven. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, And in the days of these kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we have the revelation here that there will be a kingdom that will be established on the earth. It will be greater than any other kingdom, and this kingdom is going to be everlasting. So now, in Matthew 13, 12, he says, Whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And why is Jesus teaching in parables? He said, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. It's important for us to see what he's saying here. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't understand. And this is why there is going to be judgment. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their ears and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. Uh, now what he's saying in this passage is, if you have a desire to hear the word of God, you'll get greater understanding. If you do not want to know more, then even what you have will be taken from you. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6 in verses 9 and 10. 
They hear, they don't understand, they see, but they don't perceive. And this is applied directly to Israel and their rejection of the kingdom. So this parable has specific application to Israel. It's not about evangelistic methods in our day. It's talking about the problem that Israel have. And I think that many times we have problems interpreting the New Testament because we don't read the Old Testament. All of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels is built on the Old Testament, except the Upper Room Discourse. So if we don't study the Old Testament, we're not going to be able to correctly interpret Jesus' teaching. And Jesus' teaching in parables is going to relate to Israel. They are not about the church. They are about Israel. So we need to understand from the Old Testament what uh, Jesus is saying. We need to see the application to Israel. Isaiah chapter 6 in verses 9 and 10 that Jesus quotes here, he is saying Israel has rejected the message and therefore there is a functional judgment from God that they have rejected the message and so God says, okay, you don't want it, you're not going to understand it. But the problem is these people have closed their eyes. They are the ones who have closed their ears. It's, some people say, oh, you see, if, if you're not one of the elect, then God is not going to let you see and hear. If you're not one of the elect, then God will not allow you to understand. But that's not what this is about. It's that the people have first rejected the word of God, and then God issues a functional judgment. Okay, you don't want to understand? I won't let you understand. But the fact is that first there has been the rejection by the people of God's revelation. So what we're going to have in this parable is going to relate to Israel, which will explain their responsibility as well as their response to the offer of the kingdom. So the parable of the soils, is, uh, it's interesting that this is one that Jesus will interpret. And in Matthew 13, he will actually interpret two of the parables so that we can understand uh, their meaning. Now in Luke chapter 8, we'll go back there. All right, the parable is this. Here's his explanation in Luke 8. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who fall away, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So what we see here is that the issue is fruit bearing. Now in our day there's a lot of discussion about bearing fruit in relationship to salvation. There are those who say it's not enough to believe in Christ for salvation. You must also do good works. You must bear fruit. And uh, there's a common teaching uh, that if you are really saved then you definitely will produce fruit. You'll prove your salvation by bearing fruit. But uh, how much fruit do you have to produce? You know, I tell these people, well, look, I, I'm a 30 percenter. I've already done my 30 percent. Leave me alone. See, it's, uh, How much do you have to produce? And how are you going to quantify this anyway? Uh, so how much is going to be enough? Uh, 
And then there's always this discussion about the soils. And they talk about four different kinds of soils, uh, and it's generally agreed that the first soil, uh, the people aren't saved because the seed fell by the wayside, the birds came and devoured them, and so they say, well, yeah, these are people that uh, they, they never uh, were saved because, well, they, the gospel may have been preached to them, but Satan came and took it out of their hearts so that they couldn't believe, and a lot of strange explanations about this. But uh, that's not the point here. But generally, people, if they want to talk about salvation, they'll say, well, definitely these people were not saved. But then you have the other three soils. You have the one on the rocky ground. Uh, and they say, well, the seeds went into the soil, and they did come to life, and therefore these people were saved. Uh, and also in the other one, they, uh, the seeds that went among the thorns, uh, they say, well, yeah, they, uh, they got choked out, but they did have life, and so these people were saved. Uh, and so some say, well, they, the second, third soils, people were saved, but they didn't produce any fruit, and therefore they have no reward. And then only the ones from the fourth soil are saved, uh, according to uh, those with a Reformed theology, because they were the only ones that produced fruit. Um, so there, there's debate about the, uh, the soils and whether or not the people that, they, that are represented by the seed here are actually saved. But I think that really misses the point. The parable deals with Israel, and the point is that they have not produced fruit. Jesus came and he offered the kingdom to Israel. So... I want to analyze this parable from the standpoint of three major components that come out of the Old Testament. One, the kingdom of God is being preached to Israel. That is clearly the context. The kingdom is being preached to Israel. Secondly, the sower who sowed the seed, which is the word concerning the kingdom. And we will see, Jesus definitely declares that the seed being sown here is the message about the kingdom. And the message about the kingdom is not the same thing as the gospel of grace. They are quite different. And then the third thing that we will look at is the production of fruit. Now, can you see the kingdom of God in the Old Testament? Yes. Is there a sower who sowed seeds in the Old Testament? Again, very definitely. And is there desired fruit from Israel in the Old Testament? Yes. The answer is yes to all three of these. So first of all, we want to look at the kingdom of God that is preached to Israel. All the way through the Old Testament, a literal earthly kingdom is taught with Messiah sitting on a literal throne. Messiah came, he offered the kingdom to Israel, and now we see the response to Jesus' offer of the kingdom. So Jesus' interpretation of this parable, notice in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's what this is about. It's the word or the message about the kingdom of God. Now, certainly a person has to respond to the gospel to be part of God's kingdom, to enter into the kingdom, but that's not what Jesus is talking about in this context. We need to understand this from Matthew's biblical theology. John the Baptist preached this kingdom. All right, here's John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began his public ministry, notice his message in Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the same message. So he's saying you need to change your thinking uh, about the way you're living and what you're doing because the kingdom is at hand. It's very close. It's not here. He's not saying it's here, but he's saying it's very close to being established. And then when Jesus sent out his disciples, he sent them out and he said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the focus on the kingdom is something seen throughout the Gospel of Matthew. This is also what was emphasized in the Old Testament prophets, the literal, political, ethnic, national kingdom promised to the nation of Israel. You can see this in some detail, for example, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. And the kingdom is anticipated by Christ even after the shift that takes place in Matthew 13. Now, the question is this. If the Old Testament prophesied the coming of the kingdom, if Jesus announced the coming of the kingdom, but then announces that the kingdom is not going to come now. It's going to be taken away from his generation and given to another people. So what happens to the kingdom? If the kingdom offered by Jesus is rejected by Israel, what happens to the kingdom? In Matthew 21, verse 34, obviously the wrong verse, 43. I'm dyslexic tonight. Okay. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. It will be given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. It's interesting. He keeps coming back to this idea of fruit bearing. That if you're going to be part of this kingdom, there needs to be fruit now, the nation that he talks about here is going to be the nation of Israel in the millennium. So the nation that was there when Jesus was speaking, they have rejected the kingdom. They are not going to receive the kingdom, but it will be given to a nation, a nation of Israel in the future time. But what happens to the kingdom? So the people have rejected the offer of the kingdom because they have rejected the king. They have rejected their Messiah. That's chapter 12. So what happens to the kingdom? And it's here that Jesus gives this parable of the sower. Um, so they rejected Christ. They didn't produce the fruit of the fourth soil. And so now we're going to see the consequences of that. So we're going to have eight parables in Matthew chapter 13. And this is a very carefully constructed chapter. Matthew is very meticulous in the way he arranges his material. And we have a parable, the first parable, the parable of the sower. That's parable number one. Parable number eight is going to be directed to the disciples saying, you need to put together Old Testament information with the mystery of the kingdom that I'm presenting you now. You need to be able to put these things together so that you understand how they are going to be joined in the understanding uh, that you will need because something is going to happen from the rejection of Messiah until the establishment of his kingdom in the millennium. And so now, between the first parable and the eighth parable, we have six other parables, and they all start with the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like something. And so the first parable and the last parable are like bookends, and then we're going to see something different uh, on the six, or in the six parables in between the two. So parables 2 through 7 are parables about the mysteries of the kingdom. That is new information, not about the church, but about the kingdom. 
things that had not been revealed in the Old Testament. So the first parable is not really about the kingdom. He doesn't say uh, about the sower that this is about the kingdom. And the last parable, which is found uh, down in verse 52, uh, it's a parable, but he doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like, as he'll, he will with the other parables. So, um, there are some who say that there is a mystery form of the kingdom. It's become a rather popular phrase um, because he keeps talking about the mysteries um, of the kingdom of heaven. But it's not that the kingdom has a mystery form. The kingdom is not here. The kingdom was prophesied in the Old Testament. The kingdom never materialized when Jesus was here. It's not here now, not in any form. Some say, oh, well, it's the kingdom of God in our hearts. Well, the Bible never talks about the kingdom of God in our hearts. The kingdom coming into our hearts, it talks about people entering the kingdom, but not the kingdom entering the people. It's a very different thing. But there are some who today want to say, oh, well, there is a spiritual form of the kingdom, and Jesus is now uh, ruling in heaven. But Jesus is not sitting on David's throne, which is part of the prophecy about the kingdom. And Jesus certainly is not here on the earth. And the prophecies about the kingdom of heaven simply do not match anything that we have today. So when you read uh, uh, people talking about being kingdom-oriented today, they have really distorted the teaching of the Word of God. And the, the talk about the kingdom today and even songs about the kingdom, uh, they certainly are not going to match up with the teaching of Scripture. So there is no kingdom today, and I don't believe there is a mystery form of the kingdom, uh, because the kingdom has not been established. It has not yet been inaugurated. And so uh, what we have in Matthew 13, they will tell us about conditions on the earth from the time that the kingdom is postponed until the kingdom is established. So there is a formal rejection of the kingdom by Israel. They've committed the unforgivable sin. And so Jesus is now going to reveal things that happen from that rejection until the establishment of the kingdom. Now, the parable of the sower is applied to Israel, explaining their failure to hear, to see, and understand the offer of the kingdom. So now we want to look at the sower. A sower went out to sow. Now, who is the sower? It's a question we have to answer. Is it a Pharisee? Is it a disciple? Is it an evangelist in our day? Do you go out and sow seeds? Is that what this is talking about? Is, it, is God the sower or is the sower Jesus? There have been a lot of different answers to this question about who is the sower. Now, the Old Testament prophet's primary role was to reveal to Israel their breach of the covenant. The Old Testament prophets were not preaching moral reform, but rather they were saying, you entered into a covenant with God at Sinai, and you said, we will keep this covenant. And they broke that covenant over and over again, and the Prophets kept saying, come back to this covenant that you signed at Sinai. You need to return to that so that you do not come under the divine discipline that is laid out in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28, where God announced, if you keep the covenant, I will bless you. If you break the covenant, then I am going to curse you. 
and we see specific ways in which God has announced judgment upon the nation of Israel for breaking the covenant. And the prophets kept calling these people to come back to the covenant and to begin to keep the covenant so that they could enjoy the things that were promised by God. Also, the prophets constantly emphasized God's faithfulness in keeping his covenant promises. Um, Now, if we go to the book of Hosea, we see Hosea talking to people about the covenant that they have broken and what will be the results of that covenant uh, breaking by Israel. So we, uh, I want to look at some things in Hosea because I think that it relates directly to Matthew chapter 13 and why Jesus preached this parable about the sower. Hosea was a prophet in the uh, 8th century B.C., uh, primarily to the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is named Israel. Its capital is Samaria. Sometimes the northern kingdom is also called Ephraim after its largest tribe. All right, in Hosea, chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord began to speak by Hosea. The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. You want to be a prophet? (laughs) I go to Africa every year, and uh, it seems that many men down there want to take titles to themselves, and so they uh, will walk up and introduce themselves. Well, I'm apostle so-and-so, and and, uh, some have uh, gone further, and and they say, well, I'm prophet so-and-so. And then last year when I was there, I heard something I'd never heard before. I was really surprised. They were talking about what their titles were, and one said, well, you're a prophet, but I want you to know I'm a major prophet. <laughs> Somewhere he had heard about major prophets and minor prophets, and so he, he arrogated to himself this title of a major prophet. Uh, of course, Isaiah never said, I'm a major prophet, or <laughs> uh, Hosea didn't say, I'm a minor prophet. But uh, we have here Hosea, and he has been given a very difficult task. Uh, He was to marry a woman who will become immoral, who will commit adultery. And um, this is going to be a picture of Israel's unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now it says here, uh, the land has committed great harlotry. Well, the land, of course, means the people of the land. They had committed spiritual adultery by departing from the Lord, by uh, worshiping false gods, by getting involved in idolatry. So Hosea is going to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. And Gomer will give birth to three children, and God names these three children. And they have unusual names. Each one will be a reminder of the broken relationship between God and unfaithful Israel. Now the first child was a son, and the Lord said to name him Jezreel. So she conceived, she bore him a son, and the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel, on the house of Jehu, and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Jezreel, it's a name which translated means God sows. God is going to scatter seed. So the name means God sows. And this is important. And we're going to see that the names of the children in Hosea 1 and 2 are very significant. God 
sows. Now, Jezreel actually was already the name of a place in Israel. There had been a terrible slaughter under the king of the northern kingdom, a uh, king by the name of Jehu. This is found in 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10. And Jehu killed Ahab and Jezebel as he had been commanded by the Lord. But then Jehu went out and he killed also the king of the southern kingdom and 42 of the king's relatives. So there was a great slaughter at Jezreel. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 22. Now God announces that he is going to avenge that slaughter of the southern king and all of his family. And in doing so, God is going to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. That's what he announces here. He is going to uh, avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel, where that great slaughter took place. And he will bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So, uh, in verse 5, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And so we're going to find that the northern kingdom is going to go down. We know, of course, that this was fulfilled in 722 at the hands of the Assyrians. All right, now in verse 6, she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. So Lo Ruhama means no mercy. So we translate the name, no mercy. What a horrible name. I've known a couple of girls named Mercy, but I've never met one named No Mercy. But God said, this is what you were to call this daughter, because it was to show that God was no longer to, uh, to continue showing mercy to Israel because she had been unfaithful to the Lord. And so he announces this judgment on the northern kingdom. They would be destroyed. So he's no longer going to show compassion. He's no longer going to rescue Israel from destru destruction. He says, yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. Understand, Judah is the southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. He said, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah. I will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow nor by sword or battle by horses or horsemen. So God is going to show mercy to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, he is going to deliver them from the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians did destroy the northern kingdom, but you will recall the Assyrians also went and they surrounded Jerusalem, and they were about to attack Jerusalem and destroy it, and you know what happened. In one night, the Lord himself killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Overnight, God destroyed the Assyrian army all by himself. And so Israel obviously is delivered, but they didn't do anything themselves to bring that about. But it was the angel of the Lord who killed the Assyrian army. Uh, you can see this in Isaiah 37 and in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. All right, so God announces, I will destroy the northern kingdom. I'm going to have mercy on the southern kingdom. All right, now, uh, Gomer, when she had weaned Lo Ruhama, no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And God said, call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. 
So lo ami means not my people. Of course, God can't break his covenant promises to his people, but the relationship that they had enjoyed in the past cannot continue. So he says, you are not my people. And this last phrase in the verse, and I will not be your God, literally translated, uh, it says, I am not, I am to you. You recall when Moses said, who, who shall I say sent me? And God said, tell them I am sent you. Here he says, I am not, I am to you. In other words, I'm not the covenant keeping God to you because you have forsaken me. You've turned your back on me. He would remove the protection that he had formerly provided. He is going to allow another nation to inv invade and to discipline his people. Of course, God will ultimately keep his covenant promises to Israel. He cannot break those. So, you are not my people. I am not I am to you. And yet, the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass, in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. So he's announcing judgment on a generation here, but he's saying, I'm going to keep my promises. I will keep all of my promises. So, <clears throat> then the children of Judah and the children of Israel. What do we have here? Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. They shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. They shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now this is something future. There is going to be a future day in which God sows. And notice we're going to have a joining together of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and they will appoint one head. That head will be the Messiah. This has not taken place as yet. This is uh, a future occurrence. And they shall come up out of the land. Coming up out of the land, you should note that phrase. Because this is production from something that is sown. God is going to sow, and they shall come up out of the land. Verse 1, chapter 2 of Hosea, Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Now if you have a New American Standard, you might notice there's a different translation. All right, say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama. What has happened here? Well, you see, in the, in the New American Standard Version, they didn't translate the names here. They just brought them in from, from the Hebrew. So, say to your brothers, my people. That's what Ami means. Say to your sisters, mercy, Ruhama. Notice that the word not has been dropped before, no mercy, not my people. God is saying, but there is going to come a day when God sows in the day of Jezreel when you will be my people and when you will have mercy. All right, we're going to skip over a few verses here right now and uh, we'll go down to verse 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. 
for I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. Um, in verse 16 here, when he says, they will no longer call me my master. You will no longer call me Baal. Master. Because he's going to even take this word Baal and their names out of their mouths. Um, all right. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things on the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. Again, this is something in the future. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth. It says earth here. It should be translated land. So if you have a different translation, the New American Standard, uh, or one of the other uh, contemporary translations, you will notice that it is translated, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. God says, there's going to come a day when I am going to sow. I am going to plant you in the land. I will sow her for myself in the land. Now the parable of the sower is given in reference to Israel and their response to the word of God. So the parable of the sower is not about evangelism, but about the response of the nation of Israel to the preaching of the kingdom. It's a parable about fruitfulness. And only the fourth soil is fruitful. Now, as you have heard your pastor say on more than one occasion, <laughs> you have to have maturity to produce fruit. You can have a tree. We planted two dozen fruit trees a couple of years ago, but they're not mature. So we don't have fruit yet. They're alive, but they don't produce fruit. Not yet. They're going to have to grow to maturity. So some things are going to take three years, some are five. Other trees take much longer before they can produce fruit. You have to have time to mature in order to become fruitful. All right. In Hosea 1.11, I want you to see again, the northern kingdom, southern kingdom will be joined together, appoint for themselves one head. That's going to be Jesus. That's going to be at the second advent. And they shall come up out of the land and great will be the day God sows. Um, in Hosea 3, 5, Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. This is looking forward to the second advent. Uh, we find this same theme in a number of other places. Uh, for example, in Amos 9.15, I will plant them in their land, and they shall no longer 
be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Um, in Isaiah 60, 21, your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. And one more, Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 6. For I have set my eyes on them for good. I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Who is the sower in the parable of the sower? From the Old Testament, we see that the one who sows is God. He's the one doing the sowing. So this is not about some evangelist going out today, but rather God is the one who is going to sow so that Israel can be established in the land. Now what Jesus does in the parable of the sower is saying a sower went out to sow and he scattered this seed. But what kind of response did he have? The first three soils are all about Israel rejecting that message about the kingdom. This is what we see in Matthew chapter 12. The sower went out to sow. What happened to the seed? It brought nothing to maturity. The kingdom message has been rejected. Well, our time is up for the night. We didn't get to the fruit, but uh, I shall return, and we will look uh, further at this. But I would encourage you, before we come together again, read this chapter, and read it in light of Israel. Read it in light of what Israel has done, what they are doing, and what God is going to do in the future. Read it with reference to Israel, not with reference to the church. And we'll see if we can shed some light on this when we come back. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a covenant-keeping God. Every promise you have ever made to Israel, you will surely cause to be fulfilled. And I'm so thankful for these promises that you have given. May it help to inform us about our attitude toward the nation of Israel today. May we have confidence in your word as a result. And I thank you that because you've kept your promises to Israel, we can have confidence you will also keep your promises to us, every one of them. So I pray that your spirit will help us to understand these things, that we might have a greater appreciation for the things that you've planned for us and provided for us. I thank you that we have freedom to assemble together to study your word and to proclaim Jesus as the only Savior. I ask now that you show us mercy by giving us safe travel to our homes and give us grace that we can come again together to fellowship with you through the word, to worship you in spirit and truth. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.